Greetings, fair listeners, and welcome once again to another episode of The Tale Collector, celebrating stories and storytelling in all their forms, and the bards and artists who bring them all to life. I'm your host, Erica Adams. This time around, I'd like to honor a man whose name likely won't be familiar to those who don't regularly play video games or keep up with gaming news and events, but whose work is still definitely worth checking out, Fumito Oeda. He is well known for leading the Japanese development team, Team Aiko, in creating their first game, also called Aiko, which has become a cult hit since its release on the PlayStation 2 back in 2001. When a friend of mine lent her copy of Aiko to me back when I was in college, I was captivated with both its visuals and its intricacies in spite of its often confusing geography. No joke, if not for the guidance of YouTube walkthrough videos, I never would have completed Aiko for the sole reason of my constantly getting lost. But I digress. Partly due to increased exposure, it was their next project that really cemented Uida's name and that of Team Ico in the world, and most especially the art, of video games. I present to you Shadow of the Colossus, released for the PlayStation 2 back in 2005, and rated T for Teen for some blood and fantasy violence. <laughs> It is rumored that in a distant land there lives a being capable of controlling the souls of the dead, only travel there is strictly forbidden. A brave warrior named Wander rejects this as he is willing to do absolutely anything to restore the life of Mono, a young girl implied to be his love interest and who has been supposedly sacrificed due to a curse. Upon reaching the ancient temple and easily dispatching some shadow creatures with the magic sword he possesses, Wander is approached by Dorman, the mysterious unseen entity that resides within the temple and is the one spoken of in the rumors. Wander asks Dorman to bring Mono back to life. It agrees, but in exchange, Wander must use his sword to slay the 16 giant beasts known as Colossi that live in various parts of the Forbidden Land. Then, and only then, will Dorman use its power to revive Mono, though it does warn Wander that he may have to pay a heavy price in the process. But Wander is undaunted. With no one but his swift and faithful horse, Agro, for company and aid, Wander sets out to battle the Colossi and fulfill his part of the bargain, no matter what it takes. Considered by many to be a spiritual successor to Ico, or even a prequel by some others, not to mention one of the greatest video games ever made, period, Shadow of the Colossus is, to this day, a highly innovative game title for a number of reasons. Unlike most traditional action-adventure games, this one is very minimalist. With no weapons or upgrades to collect, Wander has only his sword and a bow and arrows, no areas to explore, no smaller enemies to fight, and no other people or creatures to speak to. While this concept may sound dull for a video game, it works here to set the melancholy tone of the game's world and story. This is a forbidden land, after all, so it's only natural that it be deliberately devoid of almost any life aside from a few birds and lizards. The environments themselves are just gorgeous. Lush forests, immense mountainous cliffs, ancient ruins, vast deserts, all of these emphasize the feeling of isolation and powerlessness of the main character. The sounds and music serve a similar purpose. When Wander is traveling throughout the land in search of a colossus, all is utterly silent, except for the wind, the local animals, and Wander himself as he races upon Agro along the surrounding terrain. But then, a full orchestra begins to build up an atmosphere of awe and wonder, when a colossus is either nearby but not yet seen, or in sight but not yet attacking. But when the Colossus at last appears, the music strikes with a power more than worthy of the godlike beings that rule over this land. There are exceptions to this, though. During some Colossus battles, the music remains slow and subdued throughout. I found this especially unique, as game boss levels in general are most often accompanied by music that's loud and fast-paced, yet during these, the player may hear slow and somber strings, majestic church organs and bells, and even a choir that sounds more suited for a funeral than for a chaotic fight scene. Along with other reasons which I will explain shortly, this makes the battle with the final Colossus in particular exceptionally poignant. 
Each colossus differs in its appearance, its territory, and the varying methods that the player must employ to defeat it. Some stand upright or on all fours, some walk or fly or swim, some are more humanoid and others more animalistic, some attack with weapons or magic or brute force, some are relatively small, say the size of lions or elephants, while others are like towers that seem to touch the heavens. But they all appear to be made up of a combination of grass and stone, as well as fur and bone, as if they had been born from the very earth itself. Each one has a weak point in the form of a glowing sigil that must be pierced with the sword. And here's where one of the truly enthralling aspects of Shadow comes in. This game consists of virtually nothing but boss battles, and part of the game's challenge involves not only finding each colossus, but figuring out how to slay them. To reach and exploit the sigil, the player must literally scale a colossus like a mountain, using the nearby environment and or even tricking the colossus into giving the player access to the sigil. And of course, like the wild beasts they are, many colossi will attack on sight, their eyes glowing red as they emerge from their hiding place and prepare to destroy the mortal that dares to invade their territory. They will also try to shake Wander off as he climbs or runs upon their backs like an insect on a dog, or plunge into water or sand to get free from his grip before going in for the kill. And yet, and yet, despite how noble Wander's quest may seem at first glance, there are hints throughout the story that suggest he may be taking this too far. Dangerous and alien though the Colossi may be, like many other more earthly creatures, their beauty, grace, and power are to be admired and appreciated as a marvel of nature. Some of the Colossi don't even attack at all unless directly provoked. When a Colossus is defeated, a cutscene depicts its death. It lets out one final roar of agony. The light in its eyes fades out. And then, the earth quakes as the ancient behemoth's body crumbles like a magic spell breaking. And it falls, never to rise again. If the player passes the site of a fallen colossus, it may look as though it had been swallowed back into the earth, a new hill covered in grass and rock, with little indication that it had ever been a living creature at all. By the time Wander reaches the sixteenth and final colossus, so much will have happened that, rather than reveling in the glory of slaying these giant monsters, the player may possibly instead regret undertaking this mission. And besides all that, how does the player know that Dorman will keep its word to revive Mono? Will Mano really awaken after all this? Is her brief mortal life truly worth the destruction of these awesomely beautiful beasts that, up to now, had kept to themselves? Ueda and his team really strove for realism in the creation of this game, and it shows. Since its release, Shadow of the Colossus has been cited as a prime example of video game art, and I personally could not agree more. This game is both a visual wonder and a beautifully heartrending story that deserves to be experienced. Gather round next time for another tale you may have forgotten or have never heard before. Until then, listeners, may inspiration always find you.